podcast, where we talk with the people behind the current events and breakthroughs in brain implants in an understandable way, helping bring together various fields involved in neuroprosthetics. Here is your host, Ladin Yurichek. Okay, Daniel Powell, pleasure to have you on the show. And usually I introduce a guest, but I want to try something new. And in the spirit of fun, you know, this is, this is, it's a fun show and educational and everything like this. I'm going to play a game of explain your job badly. And so basically your job is to electrocute babies so that they stop crying. <laughs> right? <laughs> Wow, I did not sign up for this. <laughs> so, <laughs> the worst PR ever, but yes, that, that is absolutely the worst way to describe my job. Thank you. Sorry about that. Do you want to do you want to talk a little bit about to what you actually do, or or the reason that you could describe what you do in this way? Uh, absolutely. So, what we are developing at uh, Spark by Medical is an auricular nerve stimulator, which is uh, the auricular being around the ear, and uh, transcutaneous nerve stimulator. So it's a, it's a wearable device, and it's designed to uh, stimulate specific cranial nerve branches that come up and near the ear, and specifically create an action that relieves opioid withdrawal. And we are working on a product line for both adults and uh, also for babies born into withdrawal. And uh, the overall idea is that we can alleviate the symptoms associated with withdrawal, which is, well, in adults, it's shaking and anxiety and sweating and goosebumps and nausea and irritable bowels. But in babies, it's a high-pitched scream and they can't sleep and, it's, uh, and they shake. And it's a, a very traumatic thing for a baby to go through. Yeah, because the auricular nerve is actually kind of connected to the vagus nerve, and so it's, it has kind of a calming effect on the body. Do you think it could potentially work with preterm infants or some other, I don't know, uh, babies that are not having a good time to, to kind of calm them down? Right now, we've just focused on neonatals, so n newborns. We have hypothesized this could also be used prenatal for both the mother and the unborn infant, but that's an extremely difficult clinical study to run and get. So so we're, we're hitting the, the easier, or let's say lower hanging fruit uh, options first with just normal adult withdrawal. And then and, and neonatal withdrawal is hard enough as it is, uh, but we're, we have a fantastic partner with the Medical University of South Carolina and already have that study approved and about to start as soon as we finish our baby earpiece. That's incredible. Is there any other alternative for, for these babies? No, right now for infants, there's nothing on the market like this. Right now, the, stand, the gold standard of care is to give morphine every four hours to the babies, which is just, you know, really rough. You're taking what's almost always a premature, underweight baby and then introducing such a heavy narcotic as morphine. And then they would wean them down off the morphine over a two-week period as sort of the standard. So we're hoping, you know, our um, primary outcome from the study is just reduction in morphine equivalents, which would show that we they would be able to wean them off the opioid faster. Ultimately, it would, it would be fantastic if it was a complete replacement for any morphine therapy. We just don't know yet until we really get the data. And how long do you hypothesize that it would take to wean them off, or how long would your treatment take? I would purely be guessing on the neonatals right now. For a typical adult, you have about a five-day detox period to get through the worst of the withdrawal. So our clinical study is going to follow the infants for five days and, and see what what we learn from that. Since this will be our first time out, uh, that we're, we're just going to learn from it and then adjust accordingly. The, with the average stay is 14 to 21 days in the NICU, an, an infant going through what they'll call neo, neonatal abstinence syndrome or neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome. This is very kind of strange. I mean, how did you guys come up with this? I mean, did you like, uh, you know, stimulating the ear to prevent withdrawal? I mean, that's that's a very strange thing. Did you did you study this? How did you guys kind of come about this? We actually, so there's a lot of evidence and experience in acupuncture and acupuncture stimulation specifically for withdrawal. And there is acupuncture-based devices and solutions on the market that gave the inspiration 
clearly with the the opioid epidemic, there's a, a large need, and we believed we could take a non-invasive, no needles, no no acupuncture using transcutaneous stem approach to achieve the same uh, results for adults specifically. And really, while we were building uh, the business plan for the company and and designing the clinical and looking at what what the real needs were, we just you know came across and became acutely aware of the real burden of the the epidemic on neonatals, the most innocent of the victims of this epidemic, and just said to ourselves, we have to do something about it and put forth a plan to to start to figure out a solution. What was really nice is there has been some corroborating research over the years, not specifically what we're doing, but there's been a couple of tangential studies that gave us enough of a confidence that the neonatal would work uh, much like the adult would work. Okay. And so, yeah, why did you choose to go after that? Was it purely like, okay, these are the most innocent victims of it? Or also, was it a business decision like, okay, the approval could be easier because it is maybe more innocent or maybe there isn't another treatment available for them. So why did you choose babies? Yeah, actually, it's not near the population of adults. And and it's much more difficult to get through the FDA with, we believe. And we just believe. So we are doing the adult device. And for the baby device, we just felt it was our duty and responsibility to contribute wider to the science and to the solutions. We believe the adult device will be very successful. And this was just something we felt, regardless of the business plan, it had to be done to be truth, truthful. Definitely. I mean, it's maybe a little bit of a sacrifice, especially if it is harder to get through the FDA, you know, more money, more time and everything like this. But yeah, that, that definitely is. If you not, If not you, then who? But I wonder, what does the device look like? I mean, presumably babies, I mean, some are big, some are small. I mean, it's smaller. And then how do you place your device? What does it look like? Yeah, so the main piece, what we'll call the therapeutic interface, is a, a very lightweight, small, it's just a horseshoe-shaped uh, circuit board that's covered in foam that goes around the ear. And then we have an inner kind of a flexible inner piece that makes contact with the uh, Simba Concha, which is uh, where the, you can reach the vagus nerve. And so the whole whole device, the whole thing is extremely thin and just it's nearly a one size fits all. Babies, it's probably are two or three sizes fits all because of the different sizes. But once you get to adult, it's, it's close to a one size fits all. And yeah, it's just real low low profile and, and has an adhesive that keeps it stuck to the skin. And then you have a cable that, that powers it, that, that runs to an external pulse generator device. And then do you have to replace the device once in a while? Or presumably if it was there for two weeks, would it be there the, the entire time? Yep. The way we designed our earpieces is they're s- super easy to apply and they're daily disposable. So you just pull out a new ear, pull one earpiece off after it's uh, no longer keeping its stickiness or its conductivity and just throw a new one on. And since there's no needles or anything, it's just really easy to take one off and put the next one on. Do you have to be within a few millimeters or something like this? Or does the device kind of align itself and and hit the right spot? And how do you know that you're hitting the right spot? It's a good question. So we really worked on human factors to try to make sure the device and the way the the contacts that actually pass, we use hydrogel technology and those hydrogels, the way they line up on where the nerve would be, they're, they're pretty big footprint. Especially for there's two outer there's two of them on the outside of the ear, and then there's the one on the in, inside of the ear in the Simba Concha, and uh, the outer one's pretty big footprint uh, to really forgive any placement issues, so that works real nicely. And then the inner ear one, you know, once you've seen a picture and done it once, it's it's designed to be very easy to reproduce and know you're in the spot. Speaking for the adults, you'd know pretty pretty easily. I mean, it's. it's I've put it on myself dozens of times. You almost cannot get it wrong. If we've done our job right, you can't put it on right, wrong. So what are the effects? I mean, what are the kind of immediate effects? Like, is there an immediate like calming sensation? Or how do you know that you're doing it right? And maybe maybe even like, hey, is the device even turned on? Maybe we forgot to plug it in or something like that. Yeah, you feel a little paresthesia. So you would know it's on. You feel a little tingly, just like if you had a TENS device. 
uh, or whatnot. And it's, uh, you know, that little, that little contraction when you feel uh, the electricity. So I'll speak specifically to adult because that's where we have pilot data and the most experience. And so when you're measuring the withdrawal symptoms, you can just watch them over a 30 to 60 minute time period go away. And they're very objective. You can know it's working because it's very objective measurements like goosebumps, like sweating, pupil dilation, heart rate, rate. Uh, these nice measurable objective things will start to stabilize and, and go to a, a normal levels. And you'll be able to see that sometimes within five, 10 minutes, but definitely within 30. Then in our first pilot study uh, of five patients, we had a 90% reduction in all those symptoms in an hour. So you're talking a pretty dramatic physical observable effect that is almost completely diminished within the hour. Wow. That's incredibly clear. Sorry. I'll describe it as our, the doctor who did our pilot study. He said, you know, to put this in clinical terms, this is somebody that was basically in a fetal position, losing their mind. And, an, uh, you know, when they started the therapy and an hour later, they're just sitting on the couch talking to the doctor normal and with just complete clarity, like, you know, I really want to kick this habit this time, or this is, you know, this is really going to work this time with, with, without all that anxiety and fear going through their, their brain, they are able to really communicate and engage and start to talk about therapy. Wow. That's incredible. I mean, that seems like a slam dunk for the FDA. What, what kind of problems have you had with them? Or, or I mean, is it just typical, typical issues to, to get things approved or what exactly? Yeah, uh, no problems with the FDA at all. We were going. Th we went through our pre-submission process, which for anyone listening, I, I always recommend you do a pre-submission. You don't just show up and hope what you did. Uh, what, whatever you had put together, you don't just hope that the FDA likes. But And so in a pre-submission, you actually write down what questions you want answered and you submit them to the FDA. And then they, they come back within 90 days and sit, they either have a sit down meeting with you or a phone call and they answer your questions. And uh, they gave us real clear direction, and that prompted us. Our first pre-sub did prompt a second one where they really wanted to see our clinical study design. We had not got to the point where we were ready to show it to them. So then we, we said, you know, this is the indication. This is the technology. This is our approach. This is the background. And then they gave us feedback, which was great. They said, we want to see the clinical study. And then we presented the clinical study. They gave feedback on that. And I would say the only challenge we have, which was, you know, so many scientists listen to your podcast, they, they'll maybe find this humorous, is when we got finished calculating the power of the study, we had an N of four, which is completely ridiculous to the average person. But when you have extremely physiological, objective physiological measurements that are reduced at the rate of like 90%, and the, this is the CAL score, which is the gold standard of measuring opioid withdrawal. And then in one hour, you can repeatedly, with almost no variation, reduce those symptoms by 90%, you end up with a really small N. Optically, nobody's happy with that. And so we ended up with a 40-patient study, and it, it's just a number that makes everybody happy, but it's, it's extremely overpowered, uh, which is fine. It's what's necessary for people to take it credible. Wow, that's incredible! <laughs> your your results were so clear that yeah, you didn't even need you didn't even need to run that big of studies, which is kind of crazy in biology because biology usually is so noisy and it's hard to kind of tease out some kind of results. So I think your guys' results are even better than the link between smoking and cancer. So that's pretty incredible stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well. The nice thing is with 40 patients, we'll have, you know, we'll have a really robust data set to, to know what to do next if there are refinements and tweaks to further improve it. So this wasn't your first rodeo. This wasn't your first device necessarily by Spark Biomedical. What ha how have you guys kind of gone through this uh, and, and both in the FDA and I guess on the business side of things too? No, this is Spark's first project and product. Well, I mean, the, the, I'll put the adult and the uh, neonatal together as the same project. They're just, you know, two flavors of it. But no, we were formed specifically to do this at the end of 2018. And this is why well, we had several of the people in the company, we've all worked together in the past, had a lot of respect and for the knowledge. And, uh, you know, I've 
with all of us with 15 to 25 years in specifically neurotech, neuromodulation. We had a pretty good network of people to call on to to uh, put together a pretty good team. Very cool. Yeah. So how was it? How was the business side of things, I guess, raising money. You know, we, we had talked about this a little bit before too, about ownership, raising money, partnering with scientists. I, I'm very curious to hear about your perspective with this. And especially since it's such a fresh company, I mean, it's a little over a year now. Yeah, it's gone well, but we definitely have a compelling story and the right team together. That is everything we're doing is we're doing it the right way. Uh, so, we, you know, just we did a friends, what we call a friends and family round to, to really get our proof of concept down and make sure everything worked. And a lot of the people investing in that were just that, friends and family, and specifically people we'd work with in the neurostem business. Yeah, I've, I've been at Cyberonics and St. Jude Medical and other neurostem companies, and we had people with background at Medtronic and, and Abbott. So when we called it, you know, started reaching out to people, there were a lot of people very familiar with industry that were pretty ready to be on the ground floor with a, a small investment. And then with our FDA pre-submission done, our regulatory path really clear in that first pilot clinical data to give us the confidence that we're on to something here. Now, we were able to raise the second round pretty efficiently, had a really strong lead investor come in that's strong in the neurostem community. And, you know, just fell into place. So it's, you know, and the business plan is portion of it is I, I've been part of this business planning before. And, you know, there's just such a large number of this epidemic. It's also very concentrated in the U.S. So the U.S. consumes 80 percent of the world's opioids. So we're not also trying to figure out how we're going to get it into Japan and, and Australia and the U.K. and Germany, all the normal big markets. We don't have to worry about getting. I mean, there's a growing problem in those some of those markets it's by far not doesn't need to be our focus which keeps us we know exactly our regulatory path because we really only have to worry about the US in the first phase and we know the call points and it's very clear you know who's treating these patients and the treatment methodologies and then the other the other part that really helped it is you know there's no shortage of government funds, grants, and attention trying to solve the opioid epidemic. And, and maybe we could pivot to why there's an opioid epidemic, which comes to fundamentally why I believe our device is so needed. So what we've discovered uh, after all these years is you're not just addicted to opioids or the euphoria. You're really, the common, common consensus is that you're running from withdrawal a after a while. Uh, I have a family member I was talking to at Thanksgiving uh, who is a, a heroin addict and clean now. And we were talking about, well, you know, just honestly what I'm working on here. And he said, oh, yeah. He goes, I was just running from withdrawal every four to six hours. That was my whole life. And so if you look at the epidemic, four out of five people on heroin started on pain pills. At some point in time, the pain pills get cut, cut off or some life circumstance introduces heroin heroin amps up the game and the addiction to another level. And then there's and then these individuals who many, many times did not set off to do anything wrong. They did not set off to buy illicit drugs. They did not set off to misbehave or something. They were, there's so many stories of, you know, a 16 year old kid tore his ACL in football and the doctor handed him six months worth of prescriptions of high powered Oxycontin. And within a month, the kid's addicted. And, and so then we get to, well, let's talk about why this addiction is special compared to meth or cocaine or or any other drugs. And I'm not an expert in this, so I'm, I'm kind of going with the layman's approach to this discussion. But the opioids come in and chemically replace the natural endorphins that act on your opioid receptors. So first in your nervous system, there's opioid receptors, and these pass the endorphins and the chemicals that that block pain. And so if you ever see the football player break his finger and it's sticking sideways and he's like, hey, it doesn't even hurt. Well, his natural body, his body's producing natural endorphins that are blocking that pain signal. And then it wears off and then you feel pain. Well, these, the, by con consuming exogenous opioids, artificial opioids, 
your body's natural system shuts down. Uh, analogy is if you take steroids, uh, your natural testosterone shuts down. The body's lazy. It says, oh, good, you're giving me the chemical. Why do I not need, I don't need to produce this anymore. And it stops producing. So your body stops being able to produce the natural chemicals it needs to manage pain, but they're also managing anxiety and and fear and rationale because this is all tying back to the, the central nervous system. And then furthermore, your body starts to increase the number of opioid receptors and those start to multiply. So your body's becoming what I describe as hyper efficient at passing pain and all these signals, all these negative signals. And then you try to take them away and you have a nearly impossible withdrawal to endure. And, and people will describe going into withdrawals, they think they're going to die because you're also having a fight or flight mechanism kick off that's saying you're going to die without, you know, in this condition, you're going to die. And this overpowers the rational thought. And it really edges out the ability through sheer willpower for the majority of people. You just can't quit. And so I've become, I think, have a real sympathy for the plight of, uh, of what's going on in this, because the vast majority of people that are suffering from this did not start off to do something wrong. And they, they really are victims. Of it. Wow, that's pretty incredible. I mean, yeah, I, I've definitely heard about this, like the opioid epidemic. You know, they still are many times handing out, you know, prescription drugs like candy and people get hooked on it. You do, like you said, you do have an increased sensitivity to it. How does the auricular stimulation affect the sensitivity to the pain? And I guess, how does that necessarily stop it? versus, you know, coming off cold turkey or, or slowing down, kind of weaning yourself off of it? Sure. So in an acute withdrawal sense, what we believe is happening is you're actually telling the, the brainstem to produce, the like jumpstarting the, the brainstem to produce the natural occurring endorphins needed to fill those opioid receptors, mu being one, a, a key one, but also gamma and delta. And so those endorphins satiate the open receptors that are, that are screaming for the exogenous endorphin. And what we believe is that's able to satiate you through that initial five to seven day core, what we'll say, detox. But what we know is your body's still in a, you've still rewired the nervous system uh, significantly and probably could use the stimulation to manage post-acute withdrawal syndrome in the weeks and months to follow. And so what you'll see us looking more is, you know, there's the initial acute detox, acute withdrawal, and then post-acute withdrawal where you're, you're managing for the coming months through the addiction cycle. And within that, what we know is if you can get a patient to like the second and third month clean, they have a vastly uh, greater chance of staying clean. Just in the first 30 days, though, you have typically somewhere in the neighborhood of a 50% relapse, uh, according to some studies. So you go through the painful five, five days of hell, basically, and withdraw uh, without our device, and then still have a 50% chance to return using. And, and then the other piece is balancing the autonomic system and bringing down that fight or flight sense, that, that sense of anxiety and dread and fear. To, do, to restore some rational thought to the approach to what this patient now has to go through. Because now that you're clean and a couple of weeks clean and you start to get clarity on your life, you then have a really difficult process. If somebody has uh, been addicted for a long time, let's say they've lost family or spouse or job or whatever, returning to clean that up and working through the issues underlying addiction um, the, any behavioral issues that need to be fixed, you know, you, the more rational thought and, and calmness that the, uh, can be there, the, the better chance of success. Interesting. I am guess I'm wondering, like you said, that the body would stop creating its own endogenous uh, hormones and maybe there's not, not a lot, but it still seems to be there because within an hour, maybe even within 10 minutes, it, it starts producing them again. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering that like, the body is able to supply that much and that quickly for you know the whole whatever two weeks or something like this, and that that's enough to carry over or, or like counteract that huge huge amount of exogenous. That, that's that's a great question. I don't 
know the exact answer, but we, we I'll give you some anecdotal information, though, to help it, because it seems like a, a good dose of endogenous endorphins actually take you, can carry you a while. And N of one subject of ours did the stimulation for just an hour and then to, or two hours, then took the device off and had no withdrawal symptoms for the next six hours. So there definitely was a halo effect of some sort that put it in a stasis. We don't know what the duty cycle is and we don't know what that balance is yet. That's, you know, to be figured out through, you know, anybody on this podcast knows a dosing study is probably one of the most frustrating type of studies to, to do. So right now we're running the system continuously for the five days of acute withdrawal. And then we'll start to play with those parameters. But that might start to help us understand how to answer your question to understand, well, how much how much can the brain produce and how long can that those endogenous endorphins carry you until the next episode? Interesting. Probably would be good to do it on the adults because they could actually tell you like, hey, it's uh, feeling good or, or not. But I, I guess you have you have the physiological markers as well. So that, that might not be so necessary. But how far along are you guys? Like, when, when can we see this on the market? When, when can I bring my uh, addicted baby to the hospital and, and have them fixed? So we are in clinical trials today for the adult device with a partner hospital system, or really recovery system and health system. And then we are partnered with MUSC for the baby study and are hoping to do our first 20 babies starting in January, say late January or February. And so we should have the adult product, yeah, in 2020. So we should have the adult device on market, finish the clinical study and have it mar on market, let's say the second half of 2020. We're working on breakthrough status with the FDA on the baby device. And, and I'm hoping we can find a way to actually put it on the same timeline as the adult. It's a little less known. We, we got started later on the baby device and and we just we have high confidence in the adult the baby one we just we need to see the results of this the first the first study but i'm hoping it's good enough that we can go straight to market this seems really fast i mean i'm i'm actually very impressed with this like you know within a year your guys are up and running i mean uh, what do you i guess attribute it to is such clear science strong team luck Lots of money, or or wow, how is this? How is this exactly possible? I guess <laughs> I think it's definitely people. Uh, we have a lot of experience in medical devices, so we weren't. There's a lot of this we weren't just inventing for the first time. The inventor of the device, uh, Alejandro Kovalin, he has built these type of stimulators before. He was one of the original inventors of the NeuroSigma's trigeminal nerve stimulator device, uh, and one of the founders of that company many years ago, and has built several auricular and, and uh, trans, more or less transcutaneous neurostimulators over the years. Uh, and the other founder with me is Naveed Kadapras, who his life study is in neurostimulation and his PhDs in uh, neurophysiology. And so we had, a, we had a team that on day one knew the physiology, knew the engineering, and then knew the business approach. And it really made for the perfect coming together of, of partners to start this because it wasn't like we had three engineers or three marketing guys or three scientists all kind of on top of each other. We had a nice, and I will say that was just luck, but my, my wife often says that was the universe conspiring to make us successful because the world needs this. So it was really advantageous to have a diverse skill set on day one. And then we brought in people from quality and regulatory with with deep roots in the industry to really make sure we're doing everything correct and, and make really smart decisions the first time. And they have not all been right. We've been wrong a bunch of times. So I don't want to pretend we've been, a, I used to think we were a special snowflake and we are not. We, we definitely have, it, it's hard work and it's a lot of perseverance. Interesting. So that's probably your biggest takeaway or biggest advice for would-be entrepreneurs is to get a diverse team, get, don't have the three marketers, have everybody from all the aspects of the project that you're going to need uh, to be, who, who have probably already done it too, and is uh, maybe even second nature to them. Like, oh yeah, you know, clinical trials, no problem. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, 20 years in the industry means there's a lot of phone number, a lot of advice we could call on people if we didn't know and, and get feedback. Also put together a good board of directors with good guidance to help you that are 
that are looking after you. And, and but you know what will kill a startup in a heartbeat is the people and, and the and the heart of the people and their ability to work together and, and get along and build a culture. And I'd say above and by, beyond everything, we focused on that from the very beginning to be extremely focused on running the business right, treating people right, treating everybody that's part of this. Uh, we've all worked for some big, large companies that we all have our battle scars from bad management and seeing things done and, and cut corners cut. And we're just all very unified in our, our approach to business and, and how we treat each other. And so I, I think that's, I will say that's been the key to success because otherwise we would have given up a couple of times if we didn't all stick to it together. Yeah, definitely. It kind of keeps you going like each person's motivation waxes and wanes. And, and you know, so it can, it can be good to have somebody else carry you through during your low times and you can carry them during during their low times. But do you think, does this complicate ownership at all? Like having a lot of people and then, you know, board directors? I mean, it is it is the typical thing, you know, in a startup, but that is something that, that we had talked about earlier too. Yeah, it's definitely something you have to manage carefully and be thoughtful because you don't know, every time you do a round for money, you you dilute everybody. But, I, you know, on that, I think we've we've tried to push greed aside. If you really trust everyone you're with, then you're not worried about not having a majority of the shares and controlling everything. It's when you have somebody who's just trying to hold on to 75% of the stock and then make everybody work for peanuts. I think we've been fairly generous and fairly reasonable because, you know, owning 75% of zero is zero. <laughs> the math works pretty easy. But if you end up at the end of the day and own 15 or 10% of something really, really successful, you know, and it was funny. We we had those exact conversations, and all I can recommend is definitely you want to ask a lot of advice and and look at what the norms are in the industry for for equity and everything. But luckily, we have not had any problems with that. Yeah, that's really good. And I mean, you know, you can be well, I guess, greedy and try to you know do everything yourself and and figuring everything out yourself. But an old roommate of mine said that uh, used to joke that a a year in the lab could save you a half hour conversation. And I'm, I'm assuming it could be the same with partners as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I tell you, one of the challenges is we've built the whole company remotely. And, and that's, you know, we don't blow money by having an office space and rent and electricity and, and common area maintenance and all those things. But it, it takes a special amount of management to really have a completely remote team, but I, I'm hoping we're going to be kind of a case study of how that was done because we are pulling it Are you off. guys all in one location or like all in nationally or internationally or how, how is it for you guys? Everybody's in the U.S., but we have people in Houston, Dallas, L.A. Those are the main cities we're spread out over. What are some tips with uh, being able to have a remote team? One of the core ones is going to be regular meetings and, and we do video conference. So you're actually seeing each other Really, you need good project management. You you need clear goals, clear communication. You definitely can't rely on waiting for someone to reply to an email later in the day. You pick up the phone and talk and work things through. You definitely you need to really pay attention to the details and, and outline and set expectations, and then work through the challenges as soon as they start to come up. And and still, you have to get together in person every once in a while. We try to at least once a quarter put as many people in one room as possible and fly in and have planning meetings and, and really work through. You tend to get so much done in that short amount of time, uh, but it, it it's the pros and cons because we, we're not, we didn't spend $200,000 on office space this last year, which somebody easily would. Even a hundred, you know, that, that money's gone. And so that's what we've been avoiding. I, I think, uh, you know, having an office space, you, you might be like, oh, look how much we completed during this short burst. But that would not be sustainable. That would not be going on for weeks and months or something like this that would kind of go back to maybe, I don't know, if all office office life, you know, a little bit slower. But I think that that when you guys get together, it really is like a sprint. And then you get, you get a lot together that, that wouldn't happen normally. Yeah, and it's actually worked well because we've assembled a team that actually happened to want this kind of quality of life. They could pick their kids up after school because they weren't in an office or 
spent, you know, only wanted to work 20 hours a week and that's all we needed. And so we didn't have to say, hey, quit your job, come on to this risky startup. What ended up happening is we assembled a good team of people who are tired of corporate life, wanted to consult, and we're just a perfect match for our type of needs. Wow. Yeah, that definitely, that sounds, that sounds ideal. I mean, and then, you know, pay for results versus paying for hours. I think that's definitely the better way to do it too. Yeah. Very cool. You still end up paying for too many hours though. <laughs> <laughs> as a side. That, that's true. That's true. <laughs> as much as you try. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know, like, so with this podcast too, I'm, you know, I, I have some employees helping me and it's, it's really nice and uh, kind of take the burden off some of the things, but uh, I like to pay, I, I, I don't even, I don't even want to know how many hours you spend on something and, you know, maybe in the beginning, like figure out, okay, this is how long it should take, but then I'll, I'll pay for the results. And if, uh, if you end up figuring out how to do it faster, that's on you, you essentially get Get paid double or whatever, but that's kind of the way to do it. But, but you know, for something like you, you know, you're breaking new ground. That might be a little bit more difficult. But yeah, I, I completely agree. I think this is a very good philosophy and freedom, independence. I I love those two things. Yep, it, it really is nice. It's been very rewarding uh, to work with a team in this environment. Yeah, it must it must come from you being a Texan. <laughs> well, you know what they say: I, I'm American by birth, but Texan by the grace of God. Excellent. As only a Texan would say. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Daniel Powell, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, is there anything that we didn't talk about that you wanted to mention? No, I really appreciate the time and uh, love your podcast. And I feel like it's an honor because I'm not an implantable solution, but I made the Neural Implant Podcast. So uh, I really appreciate it and uh, I really enjoyed what you deliver to the industry. So thank you. Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new, bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.